Well, shalom, me homies. How are y'all doing today? I hope you're fighting the good fight. You're maintaining your vigilance, your passion, and joy. You know, today would be a great day for those of you that have not to dive into the depths of the wonders of the word. You know what I'm saying? There's a lot of difficult things that are taking place for a lot of people right now. But you know what? This is a great opportunity for us to persevere in finding the treasures that are found in the word of life. So my question for you is, Has you have you gone mining in the wonderful depths of the scriptures today? And if not, hey, let's do it together. You know what? Let's, let's, let's go co-labor together, shall we? Because I was reading in Philippians this morning, just, and I just found this treasure in here about the word of life. And I just, I just love hearing things like that because you know what? There's a lot of things we can focus on and dive into lots of different topics, which are fun and exciting and exhilarating, but it's an imperative for us to be rooted and grounded in a, in a deep understanding of what the Father's perspective is on things. And he gave us this wonderful witness in his son as the guideline for us to be able to devote our lives to. So I want to just jump in right here. Let's do this, shall we? This is Philippians chapter 2. If then there is any encouragement in Messiah, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of spirit, if any affection and compassion, Make my joy complete by being of the same mind, having the same love, one in being and of purpose, doing none at all through selfishness or self-conceit, but in humility. Consider others better than yourselves. Each one should look out not only for his own interests, but also for the interests of others. For let this mind be in you, which was also in Messiah Yeshua, who being in the form of Elohim, did not regard equality with Elohim a matter to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a servant, and came to be in the likeness of men. And having been found in fashion as man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, death even of a stake. Elohim therefore has greatly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Yeshua every knee should bow, of those in heaven and of those on earth, and of those under the earth. And every tongue should confess that Yeshua Messiah is master to the esteem of Elohim the Father. You know how powerful of a statement and a declarative stance this is? This is one of those words that's very contentious with folks, because you're dealing with a, decl a declaration, like an absolute truth. And we're being groomed by predators to live in a society that compromises the truth that does not hold to what would be an absolute truth they don't it's not popular by their design to be so declarative in such a statement but here we have these words because of all of the the gods we could be worshiping of all the mighty ones the immortals that people bow down to and subject themselves to there is a prerequisite that is in our Messiah, in Yeshua of Nazareth, that's so unique in the form of, sub, of servitude that he, that he brought to the nations. Like when it says he humbled himself, he emptied himself, like he took off the very nature of power. And this is so counterintuitive to what every other exalted mighty one would, would model towards people. Like if you study the myths and the legends and the history of these other gods, of these other immortals, pride is what you'll find as like the, the, the deep rooted characteristic that drives so much of what their kingdom is ruled by. And it says in the book of Job, Leviathan, right? This great sea monster. This is the king of all the children of pride. He is like the of all of the created beings. He is the most powerful ruler over the children of pride. So people that are dealing with like a subjection that are they're dealing with the stronghold of pride, the dominion, like the rulership, the legal authority over them is Leviathan. And this is a big deal because you have different hierarchies and then these mighty ones have different arenas that they're governing over. Like we've talked about how they're divided. But here we have such a powerful counterforce that's trying to demonstrate towards us his way of leadership, his way of authority. Like we talked about in the last episode on the power that he had in washing the feet of his disciples and those that like what a powerful statement it is. If you're a leader of industry, if you're a leader of your home or of a school or of a business, like how powerful and profound it is for you to become the servant to those that are entrusted to you. It's a form of showing power. But by doing so, 
You're showing them that you are willing to subject yourself to the lowest position in order to understand and relate to them and their needs. And it's a true triumph against this, I mean, what otherwise is very seductive, the desire to hold power when you have it. Like we see, this is the great struggle that King Saul had. Like if you go back into the kingship of Israel and the early phases of it in First and Second Samuel, and you see this, the difficulty that you have when Yahuwah chose a different king to leave Saul behind. You know, he's like, he sent Samuel out to anoint David to be the king over Israel. Paul knows about this. He learns about it later on, right? And he seeks every day of his life to kill David. That's what he does with his rulership. Instead of devoting the resources to blotting out the enemies like he was commanded to do, like with Amalek, he was called to be the king that was going to fulfill a prophecy, a promise that was given that Amalek and his descendants would be blotted out from heaven, like from under heaven, that their name would be literally blotted out. We see a parallel to this for those that are taking the mark of the beast, right? That are their names are getting blotted out of the Lamb's book of life. It's a huge deal to understand if your name is in there and then have it taken out. These are things that we got to be very careful about. But Amalek had this specific tactic that he did when the Israelites were coming out of the crossing of the Red Sea and they were, I mean, fatigued, tired, worn out, right? He attacked them and he attacked the elderly and the weak, the disabled. He attacked them at their rear. He fought dirty in a really nasty way. And Yahuwah is absolutely furious with him and is like, we're going to blot them out forever. And he finally calls King Saul to be the guy to do that. And he doesn't. He doesn't, and he compromises. And ultimately, even this is one of the descendants that didn't get blotted out because of that. This is the people, Mordecai, the great enemy of King Esther's time, right? The, uh, oh no, sorry, Mordecai is the good guy, but the uh, Haman, the bad guy, the story, right? He's the conspiring, he's the conspiracy ruler. He's like totally the embodiment of the Black Pope of the Jesuits. He's like, I'll give you all the silver in the world. I'll give you 10,000 talents of silver. If you let me kill the Jews, he's like, that's one of the Amalekites. He's like a holdover because the word of Yahuwah was not fulfilled in Saul's ears, in his life. He didn't do it. And now you have generations later, that person being the very embodiment of once again, seeking the opportunity to blot out the kingdom of Israel. And these lingering decisions of disobedience have absolutely generational effects that sometimes don't show up for a long time later. Like in David's life, King David, he's living in, a, in his kingdom. He's established in his throne and things are going well. And then all of a sudden there's this terrible famine that takes place. And for three years, there's like scarcity of food in the land. And David's like, what is going on? And Yahuwah is like, listen, King Saul and his zealousness killed the Gibeonites. Him killing the Gibeonites had consequences that showed up in David's lifetime. The Gibeonites were people that were under that protective clause we, we talked about the, in uh, Joshua 10, where Joshua and the people entered into a covenant of peace with them, and then they were required to look after them and protect them as if they were Israelites. You know, But King Saul, when he had the priests of Yahuwah slaughtered, they also killed the Gibeonites because the Gibeonites' role was to be hewers of wood and drawers of water for the Levites. And you know what? God didn't punish Saul and his kingdom with the famine. But it showed up later on when David had an opportunity to make it right. David had an opportunity to bring mishvat, justice, for those that were crying out to it among the Gibeonites. And you know what? Yahuwah rendered deliverance to the nation of Israel because of David's obedience to fulfill his word and to, to make reciprocity with the people for what had taken place. And so these are these like clues along the story as we read in the scriptures that should give us indicators that yes there's there's times when the father puts words in our mouths that we need to be faithful to fulfill convictions that are put on our lives that we have a duty to to obey and by doing so man he grants us life and fulfillment and for those of you right now that are facing i get emails from a lot of different folks and i'm starting to see a lot of them that are that are wrestling with major life decisions right now that they have to make and they're crying. They need wisdom. They need to make decisions about their career, about things that they need to take, jobs they need to take or turn down that'll put them in different positions. You know, people that are that are dealing with relational strains because of their beliefs and how much that's that's pulling on them and that's weighing them down. But you know what? This is why I think that the example that we have in the Messiah is so powerful and we can never lose sight of it about what he did to subject himself to the Father's will and his word, even when his flesh was in pain and, and troubled 
and wanting to resist obeying the word like you see in the garden when he's being tempted and that that strain and that pressure of what's being put on him, the burden of his responsibilities. Those were the moments where we see his strength exuded in such a powerful and profound way because humbling himself and taking on the form of a man was one aspect of it, but it was those giving himself the limitations of what it's like to not be able to call 10,000 legions, 10 legions of angels to, to rescue him. He could have called legions of immortals, thousands and thousands, tens of thousands of these immortals to wage a war on his behalf. You know, and like later when he comes back, we see him bringing the army of the heavenly host with him. Like what an awesome and glorious moment. Let's go to second Thessalonians. Because it's just, he he subjected himself to the word of the father, whereas you saw King Saul resisted it. And when he should have stepped down and allowed David to reign and be the king, he didn't. Pride puffed him up. He wanted to be exalted in the eyes of the people. He did not want to step down. He didn't want his weakness to be shown in front of the people. And he's like, just please esteem me, Samuel. Esteem me. Whereas you see, literally, the father esteems Yeshua. The father esteemed the Messiah and exalted him. Gave him the name over every name. Go to Second Thessalonians. I'm reading from the uh, ISR scriptures. For those of you that are new, I have an entire audio recording of the scriptures that I did out of this. If you have never heard it before, it's free for download, uh, available to you. It's just in the description below. There's all kinds of links and treasure, treasure hunting. I got my audio book for the book Snatch from the Flames that I wrote as well, and the ebook. It's all there. It's a gift for you guys. Others have paid for you to have this wonderful gift of life. So. Thank you to those of you that have done that. Appreciate you guys. Second Thessalonians. Let's just jump in here. Flaming fire. First chapter one. Shaul and Silas and Timotheos to the assembly of the Thessalonians in Elohim our Father and the Master Yeshua Messiah. Favor to you and peace from Elohim our Father and the Master Yeshua Messiah. We ought to give thanks to Elohim always for you. Brother says it is proper because your belief grows exceedingly. And the love every one of you has for each other is increasing, so that we ourselves boast of you among the assemblies of Elohim for your endurance and belief in all your persecutions and afflictions which you are bearing. Clear evidence of the righteous judgment of Elohim in order for you to be counted worthy of the reign of Elohim for which you also suffer since Elohim shall rightly repay, repay with affliction those who afflict you, and to give you who are afflicted rest with us when the Master Yeshua is revealed from heaven with his mighty messengers in flaming fire, taking vengeance on those who do not know Elohim and on those who do not obey the good news of our Master Yeshua Messiah who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the master and from the esteem of his strength. And when he comes to be esteemed in his set apart ones and to be admired among all those who believe in that day, because our witness to you was believed to this end, we always pray for you that our Elohim would count you worthy of this calling and complete all the good pleasure of goodness in the work of belief with power so that the name of our master, Yeshua Messiah, is esteemed in you and you in him, according to the favor of Elohim and the master, Yeshua Messiah. Man, can we just talk about those that are feeling that affliction right now? I just pray that rest would be given to you in those areas of your life where you are feeling that affliction. But listen, this is the things that are promised to us along this journey, that that series of afflictions that we experience, let's go to Matthew 7. This is the narrow way. You know, I often quote this verse, but I, I never I never fully quote this aspect of it where it says, this is in chapter seven, it says, enter in through the narrow gate because the gate is wide and the way is broad that leads to destruction. And there are many who enter into it because the gate is narrow and the way is hard, hard pressed or the way is afflicted that leads to life. And there are few who find it. The way that leads to life is hard pressed. It's narrow, it's precipitous, and it's full of affliction. And this is the reality of what our Messiah experienced and what the prophets experienced, what Moses experienced, what Joseph experienced. We see all of these witnesses in the Torah and in the, 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 the prophets and in the writings of facing affliction, of facing 
suffering. Got like in Psalm 108, man, I think it's 108. Let's go there. Let's see. Oh no, 105. There's these like synopsis chapters as you read about in the scriptures. And this is one that talks about Yosef in here. Let's jump in here. He allowed, verse 14, he allowed no one to oppress them. And he reproved sovereigns for their sake, saying, do not touch my anointed ones and do my prophets no evil. And he called for a scarcity of food in the land. He cut off all the supply of bread. He sent ahead of them a man, Yosef sold as a slave, and they afflicted his feet with shackles. His neck was put in irons until the time that his word came. The word of Yahuwah tried him. The sovereign sent and released him. The ruler of the people let him loose. He made him master of his house and ruler over all his possessions to bind his chiefs at his pleasure and to teach his elders wisdom. Then Yisrael came to Mitzrayim. Real quick though, his word came and tested him. His word came and tried him and examined him. Like when we have afflictions in our life, those of you that are going through those experiences, it's bringing to the surface what is in you. It's going to reveal what's already gotten into you. It's going to germinate the seeds of what you have been eating from, what fruit of what tree you've been consuming. And you know, it's, it's painful, you guys. Sometimes I jump, I jump on Facebook. Because we have a group there called Becoming a Linenite. For those of you that are on Facebook, you guys should join that group. It's absolutely wonderful people. And we talk about all kinds of different topics on there, like natural fibers, natural living, you know, all that kind of stuff. It's it's a wonderful place. We don't we don't do all of the hot button topics of debates, but I can't jump into and I know everyone's got their own artificially created feed that's generated in each of these different social media platforms. They call them the algorithm, right? It's like the gods of the algorithm. But I'll jump on there, you guys, and it is just a slaughter fest of contention and strife and arguing and fighting and people putting up content in, to incite their neighbors. You know, they're putting up salacious content to inci incite their neighbors to argue and to fight and to create division. And I see this more than I see. Well, there's probably still a good amount of beneficial posts and things like that. But I see this contention and some people that have this inward desire to fight with each other, you know, and to provoke each other. And it's like, I raise children every day and I can't stand the fighting. You know what I'm saying? Like the fighting and the argumentativeness is so exhausting. It's so frustrating. And to me, it's revelatory of a different agency influencing the minds of people like that, that, that that fight trade, that turning against each other, that mutual animosity, like it's being born out of a different fruit. Like you're chewing on the wrong fruit, you guys. If that is what is in you is to get into these debates all the time and to get into useless arguments. Like we're warned about, like don't jump into these worthless arguments because on one side of the equation, like it's just, it brings despair and it brings a lot of harm unnecessarily. And I understand some of you guys are sincerely from the depths of your heart, you're arguing for something you believe to be very important, and I get that. But at the other side of it, if you can't argue these things and contend with these things without the fruits of love, you lack maturity. Like you lack maturity if you can't bear the fruits of the Spirit while you get into these discussions and these debates. But if you're intentionally wielding that sword of your mouth in a way that's divisive and destructive, it's because you haven't grown up in a way of handling a topic with wisdom. The reason people love to hear what Solomon had to say was because he was able to reason with them on a great variety of topics in a way that was filled with not only knowledge, which can puff you up and fill you with pride and to make you a servant of the kingdom of pride. But you know what? The master, when I look at the scriptures and when I read the way that he had showdowns at times when he was spicy and ferocious. But the vast majority of times when he was trying to bring truth to people, he drew it out of them. He drew out the, the depths of the, the dross, the poison that was in them. He helped to bring that to the surface for them. But then he didn't use that as a way of crushing them. And it was such an effective strategy. Like when we go back and you read, like, let's read Matthew 6 too. Matthew 6 is good. What, he, what he's building on is a way of communicating truth to people. That's hard to hear. But the way that he does it is so powerful. It's so beautiful. Understand, these are some chapters to, to, to saturate yourself in on a regular basis. You ready for this? Chapter 6. Beware of doing your kind deeds before men in order to be seen by them. 
otherwise you have no reward from your Father in the heavens. Thus, when you do a kind deed, do not sound a trumpet before you as the hypocrites do, in the congregation and in the streets to be praised by men. Truly, I say to you, they have their reward. But when you do a kind deed, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your kind deeds shall be in secret. And your father who sees in secret shall himself reward you openly. And when you pray, you shall not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the congregations and on the corners of the streets to be seen by men. Truly, I say to you, they have their reward. But when you, but you, when you pray, go into your room and having shut your door, pray to your father who is in the secret place and your father who sees in secret shall reward you openly. And when praying, do not keep on babbling like the nations, for they think that they shall be heard for their many words. Therefore, do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask Him. This, then, is the way you should pray. Our Father who is in the heavens, let your name be set apart. Let your reign come. Let your desire be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Do not lead us into trial, but deliver us from the wicked one, because yours is the reign and the power and the esteem forever. Amen. For if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father shall also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their trespasses, neither shall your Father forgive your trespasses. And when you fast, do not be sad-faced like the hypocrites, for they disfigure their faces so that they appear to be fasting to men. Truly, I say to you, they have their reward. But you, when you fast, anoint your head and wash your face so that you do not appear to men to be fasting, but to your Father who is in the secret place, and your Father who sees in secret shall reward you openly. Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart shall be also. The lamp of the body is your eye. Therefore, if your eye is good, all your body shall be enlightened. But if your eye is evil, all your body shall be darkened. If then the light that is in within you is darkness, how great is that darkness? No one is able to serve two masters, for he shall either hate the one and love the other, or else he shall cleave to the one and despise the other. You are not able to serve Elohim and Mammon. Because of this, I say to you, do not worry about your life, what you shall eat or drink, about your body, what you shall put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the heaven, for they neither sow nor reap nor gather into storehouses, yet your Father does feed them. Are you not worth more than they? And which of you by worrying is able to add one cubit to his lifespan? So why do you worry about clothing? Note well the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. And I say to you that even Shelemah in all his esteem was not dressed like one of these. But if Elohim so clothes the grass of the field, which exists today and tomorrow is thrown into the furnace, how much more you, O little of belief, do not worry then, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For all these nations eagerly seek these. But your heavenly Father knows that you need all these. But seek first the reign of Elohim and his righteousness, and all these shall be added to you. Do not worry then about tomorrow, for tomorrow shall have its own worries. Each day has enough evil of itself. He's such a tactician at bringing out these conditions of brokenness in, the, in the, the hearts of the people that he's looking at. Because understand something, he had supernatural insight into the thoughts of everyone that he was around all the time. He had the ability to call people out on their deepest, darkest sins, their deepest, darkest shames at any given moment. And you know what? Yet the way that he brings to light what is something that is burning in pain and in the darkness of the people around him is what made him such an effective minister, such an effective priest, someone that experienced affliction is able to relate with others. Like Chelsea this morning was sitting in the kitchen talking to me about how because she, she never used to be able to relate to people with chronic illness before, but now she can. You know, here she is well over 
18 months almost of dealing with this severe illness, you know, with, with the mold toxicity and with the, just, I mean, out of control histamine responses that her body goes through in these, like she is, de she's dealing with more affliction since she got pregnant with the twins until now than ever before in her life. She's suffering from things that she never used to have to deal with or even think about. You know, it's, it's changed her mindset. It's changed the way she thinks about what she eats, what she wears, what she's going to do when she has these like reactions. Like it's changed how much she does, what she does with her life in such a powerful way. Like it changed the entire way that our relationship functions. You know, like I, I had to become a primary caregiver to my wife, which, it, which had only ever been for like seasons after she gave birth, especially, or during when she was pregnant, you know, but that season that changed our relationship dynamic so powerfully, it affected the entire hierarchy of kind of how our, our home used to function and operate to where I've had to become so much more of a caregiver to her and the caregiver to the children than I used to be. And, you know, because of that, I've also got to connect with a lot of other fathers and husbands who've had to step into that role in that position as their wives have gotten utterly devastated through chronic illness. And it, it gives me a totally different lens with which to relate to people that are enduring that suffering, that long suffering, you know, but these are, these are supposed to be the fruits of love, you know? And I, and I think if anything, it brought out in me the realization of how self-centered I was at, as to how much I expected and wanted my wife to fulfill these roles for me. And yet when she couldn't, there was a season, man, where I really struggled with bitterness about having to do these jobs and these things I didn't want to have to do. I didn't want to have to do so much of the home side of the equation, you know. But last year, when I sat down and read through the scriptures, it was go during the course of this where my wife was very much down and out and I was having to take care of the girls especially. But it gave me this this perspective shift that I needed on a regular basis. And I'm, I'm absolutely that convinced this is what happens when we seek his kingdom first for whatever the situation is that we're going through. When we seek his kingdom first and his righteousness first, when we orient ourselves around his kingdom economy, it gives us this freedom from the worry. Like, is today going to be a good day? Is she going to be doing well today? Or is it going to be a bad day? You know, like it gives us this freedom from these tensions and these anxieties, but it also gives us the armor that we need to not fall prey to the, the enemy. Like you see in his prayer, like he's giving us like an outline for things that we need to, how we orient ourselves when we're praying. And he's, when he talks about delivering us from the wicked one, not to lead us into trial, right? We're asking him, don't lead us into trial. Don't lead us into temptation. You'll hear it translated that way a lot, but to deliver us from the evil one, you know? And he says like godly, godly sorrow brings conviction and it brings repentance, which gives us deliverance. Whereas worldly sorrow leads us to despair, like hopelessness, like learned helplessness. You know, but he has these ways of convicting us and using the word to shine a spotlight on these areas of our life that no one else in the room could possibly understand. Because the truth is most of us are able to live an insulated life where we don't have people that are sitting next to us that understand the deepest levels of struggle that we're going through. And it takes radical honesty to get vulnerable with people to where we can build a relationship of trust and we can talk to people about what's going on. But the word is there continually, like the the Holy Spirit, the great counselor, and Yeshua is like called the great physician. He has the ability to see into these depths of our areas of our being and start to knit us back together. You know, like in Psalm 86, there's this prayer that I pray all the time, which says, unite my heart to fear your name. And you know, this is my prayer for people that are struggling with fear, that are struggling with anxiety and worry and doubt and insecurity that you would pray and cry out to the Father that he would unite your heart to fear him, to fear his ways. Because the, the cares of this world, the, the worries of this life that are there, those things are designed to choke us out. They're designed to, ex to extinguish in us the circulation that we need so that these living waters can flow through us, so that his spirit can flow through us. You know, like when you think about how thorns and thistles take over a field, at what they're doing is they're competing underground as much as they're on the surface. Like you can see vines crawling up a tree, like strangler figs. They'll crawl onto a tree, like attach themselves to a tree. And they will literally begin to work to pulling that tree down to the ground, ultimately taking over its position. Like these fig trees, unbelievable. They like a bird eats, eats the fig, right? And it flies up onto the branches of a tree and it poops it out. And so from there, 
the 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 seed germinates right on top on the top of a branch of a tree and then it's what it does is it'll literally drop down a root system and it'll just slowly dangle until it's it, it, in the air not even in touching any soil whatsoever and it'll continue to grow until it eventually does touch the ground and once it touches the ground you know it starts to spread out its roots into the soil system and then it starts to thicken and strengthen this cable and this is literally it'll look like string like ropes going all the way up and down these trees everywhere and it slowly begins to engulf the tree and take it over and begin to pull on the tree and it'll literally surround the entire trunk of the tree until it competes with the very circular system that's inside it and, and cuts off its supply of food and light and energy and nourishment until it destroys the actual tree like down in florida we saw these things everywhere and they would swallow a palm tree to where you'd be looking and you'd think it's a, it's a fig tree, right? But inside that entire tree was a tree that was a mature 40, 50, 60 year old palm tree. That's, that's no longer recognizable. And I think when the father really looks at a lot of our lives, that's how he sees us. He sees these burdens, like the Messiah is, is shining a light on these areas. And he's talking to people about the cares of this world. And he's also talking about people's yoking to the mighty one called mammon. He's addressing the heart and people of this, this subjection to the kingdom of mammon, right? There's other translations will just put money here, but that's not what he's talking about exclusively. He's talking about the influence that this immortal mammon has in people's lives to where they, they're willing to give up everything, including seeking his kingdom in order to pursue that. They're willing to compromise mentally, emotionally, spiritually, financially. They're mentally compromising in different arenas of their life and not and forsaking the covenant that they have with their creator the calling to a higher standard of life that he is calling them to in order to pursue this thing and a lot of times the heart of the issue is that that is for them the perspective that they'll find rescue deliverance protection provision whereas the father's trying to highlight an area yeshua is trying to highlight an area where listen this other mighty one is it wants to set himself up in the temple of your life and so be on guard against that stuff. And that's why he's dealing with generosity. That's why he's dealing with anxiety and fear all throughout this chapter, because these are the strongholds. Those are those tap roots that the enemy starts to anchor into people through wounds of affliction, of suffering that didn't get properly affixed. They didn't get the right lens put on them. I want to read again from, uh, from Matthew here a little bit later on. Oh, this is so good. I'm going to jump over you guys to Matthew 10. And having called his 12 taught ones near, he gave them authority over unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal every disease and every bodily weakness. And these are the names of the 12 emissaries. Shimon, who is called Kepha, Andre, his brother, Jacob, the son of Zabda, Yochanan, his brother, Philip and Bartholomew. Tomad, Matthiyahu, the tax collector, Jacob, the son of Alphi, and Labai, whose last name was Tadai, Shimon, the Canaanite, and Yehuda from Kiriath, who also did deliver him up. Yeshua sent these twelve out, going. Yeshua sent these twelve out, having commanded them, saying, Do not go into the way of the nations, and do not enter a city of Shamaron, but rather go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And as you go, proclaim, saying, The reign of the heavens has drawn near. Heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out demons. You have received without paying, so give without being paid. Do not acquire gold or silver or copper for your money belt or a bag for the journey or two undergarments or sandals or staffs for the worker is worthy of his food. And into whatever city or village you enter, ask who is worthy in it and stay there until you leave. And as you enter into a house, greet it. And if the house is worthy, let your peace come upon it. But if it is not worthy, let your peace return to you. And whoever does not receive you nor hear your words, when you leave that house or city, shake off the dust from your feet. For truly I say to you, it shall be more bearable for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah in the day of judgment than for that city. See, I send you out as sheep in the midst of wolves. Therefore be wise as serpents and innocent as doves. But beware of men. Man, can I just pause for a second? This is, this is why we still have a duty. Like I still feel a heavy responsibility to try to educate myself on understanding what are the methods that the enemy is using to try to fire off all of these just explosive missiles at us in so many different arenas of our life. Like 
I, I do shows in different interviews with all kinds of different folks out there. And, and because of that, I get connected to people on an international scale where I wouldn't, I wouldn't be normally concerned with kind of the same activities of what are taking place in Canada or the Netherlands or in Switzerland or Belgium. But like, because I get to reach out from people that are in South Africa, like, Oh, I love you brothers and sisters that are out there in South Africa. I get some of the most warriors of warriors who are out there. There's, there's an entire the, like the struggles of what people are experiencing in their in different countries around this world is unbelievable because the truth is the lens which they give us here in our news or our media is so filtered that like when i hear from somebody who's who's in ukraine or hear somebody who's in russia i get such a different perspective about things that i've never even heard about going on over there like i had no idea the amount of medically assisted suicide that's being utilized in the netherlands like until I had somebody that reached out to me to talk to me about that. Like I, it was just completely off my radar. I never even considered that. Right. Or somebody else that was talking about what's taking place in South Africa and really a, a reverse genocide that's taking place in a different way, land seizures and takeovers of industry and farming and communities. Like there's this total upheaval, almost a civil war that's happening right in the midst of South Africa that I'm literally completely ignorant of. And you know, I, I, I get to hear from people and because of that, it gives me a different lens with which to try to intercede. So like when I sit down to do these shows, you guys, sometimes like this is what's heavy on me is I'm, I'm groaning for the afflictions that my brothers and sisters are, are suffering with, you know, and, and an American mindset, I'll just be honest, it's really self-centered. It's it, the, the whole world is kind of in our minds here. You know, I understand unless they want to point out a different area. They're like, you got to look out for these Hutu rebels that are attacking these ships. And then they're everyone's talking about that. Right. But they're like, but there's this whole other reality of what's taking place for the people that are in Paraguay or the people that are in Brazil and the brothers that are right now just like suffering down in Mexico and dealing with the afflictions of tyrannical overreach in the cartels. Like there is so much suffering that's taking place in the body of Messiah that we don't get to hear about. But you know what? People are bearing that up. People are bearing that up right now. And this is where I'm just, I'm so thankful for those of you that have such an anointing and a, and a love for prayer and for intercession for the brothers and sisters who are out there. And I just, I just ask you and implore you spend time praying for our brothers and sisters abroad, for those that are trying to shine a light in the heart of darkness that are dealing, that are living in a land of great persecution. And you know, for some of us that that has reprieved, but for others, it's just increased every day and they're living with an unbelievable amount of suffering. And I just ask you guys to be prayerful for your brothers and sisters that are out there. Remember and understand that there are people that are crying out for daily bread and they're not just some kind of theoretical thing. There's people who are starving, who are genuinely starving, who are, who are, who don't know where their next meal comes from. And they, they're crying out to their creator, you know? answer them be be a brother and sister that answers them in their affliction that answers them for that you know i was talking on the show last night and i was just thinking about like i was read i was reading from some of these books about just the way that these rulers took over these areas of industry and influence and how by having so much financial capital to be able to deploy whenever they started one of these different groups like the fabian socialist society you know when when they started that in the 1880s in in the uk this is where so much of like, when you trace back the social justice movement, when you trace back kind of what you would call woke, is woke ideology, when you start to go down into the, the cultures of where these things came from, where do these societies get their money and their financing to do this stuff? And that's where you start to deal with like the real nobility classes that have this Luciferian ideology that are, that are, that are literally the servants for mammon. Okay, that are literally his ambassadors on this earth, and they utilize those funds to weaponize people, to eradicate morality, to destroy people's understanding of the truth, to target the nuclear family. Like these are the actual hands behind that. And then we have these people on the other side where it's like warriors for the kingdom who are desperately fighting to just be effective in their arena, who are who are poor who are suffering affliction of poverty and who are laboring in the world to try to take care of their family's basic needs. And yet at the same time are working a second and third job in the kingdom and ministering to people, you know, and I sit here and I struggle with seeing people that are so anointed for their calling. And yet they're, they're suffering that affliction as well, you know, and I just, every time I read through the scriptures, I see that this has been an issue and a tactic that the enemy has had for a long time. This has been the ways that, that people have labored for centuries because we're dealing with the same immortals that have the same different tactics that are very effective at allowing them to control many 
and keep them from coming to the great truths like you see brought out here. That Fabian, sorry for that connection there. The Fabian Socialist Society, right? Their mascot is a wolf in sheep's clothing. That is literally not a mascot. That's like that was their emblem and their logo. They since have tried to sanitize it and wash it away. But like that's literally they understood their approach was going to be like, we're going to act like good apostles, good disciples, good, good men, righteous men. But inwardly, they are the ravenous wolves. Like they fully embraced that ideology. They 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 made that their their tactic and their strategy. And they deployed this way of slowly attacking and nitpicking. And causing confusion and, and discord and chaos like that was their their tactic and you know like so when i see some of these posts and people putting these out that are supposed to be my brothers and my sisters and they're getting into these debates about something that i'm, I'm like i'm just i'm trying to recover from somebody's email that's dealing with an incredible amount of of pain incredible amount of bondage and they're desperate for healing and i'm like we need laborers in the field you know, we need people that'll weigh down into the trenches and wash the feet of those who are so wounded and wash them from the lies, from the oppression. Like I started reading again, Expelling Darkness, Russ Dizdar's book, and just seeing the preeminence that he puts upon helping people that are oppressed. And it's not always demonic stuff, right? A lot of it is the sin nature and just the the hatred, the self-hatred and the lies and the insecurities that have burgeoned out of them from that you know a lot of people just need to be washed with a restoration of their identity and they can cast off the lies those horrible things somebody said to them maybe 20 years ago that are still there you know some of you that came to the truth more recently you're dealing with those wounds from a from a family member you're dealing with those wounds from a, a spouse from a from a sister or a brother or an aunt and you got to understand this is we are promised to experience this type of affliction and this type of suffering. But for those of you, please, I just ask you, pray for your brothers and sisters that are out there. Pray for those who are experiencing these afflictions. Pray for those that are ministers on the front line. Pray for their families. Pray for their wives and or their marriages. Pray for their children. Like, Pray for those that are, that are fighting for the kingdom's fight because there's an onslaught taking place behind the scenes. And you know what? To me, that's always a good sign that we're over the target and we're potentially threatening a major areas of the enemy's kingdom. So let's keep reading here. But beware of men, for they shall deliver you up to Sanhedrins and flog you in their congregations. And you shall be brought before governors and sovereigns for my sake as a witness to them and to the nations. But when they deliver you up, do not worry about how or what you should speak, for it shall be given to you in that hour what you shall speak. For it is not you who speak, but the spirit of your father speaking in you. And brother shall deliver a brother to death, and a father his child, and children shall rise up against parents and shall put them to death. And you shall be hated by all for my name's sake. But he who shall have endured to the end shall be saved. But when they persecute you in this city, flee to another. For truly I say to you, you shall by no means have gone through the cities of Israel before the son of Adam comes. A taught one is not above his teacher, nor a servant above his master. It is enough for the taught one to become like his teacher and a servant like his master. If they've called the master of the house Beelzebul, how much more those of his household? Therefore do not fear them, for whatever is covered shall be revealed. Whatever is hidden shall be made known. What I say to you in the dark, speak in the light. What you hear in the ear, proclaim on the housetops. Do not fear those who kill the body, but are unable to kill the being, but rather fear him who is able to destroy both being and body in Gehenom. Are not two sparrows sold for a copper coin? And not one of them falls to the ground without your father. And even the hairs of your head are all numbered. So do not fear. You are worth more than many sparrows. Everyone, therefore, who shall confess me before men, him I also shall confess before my Father who is in the heavens. But whoever shall deny me before men, I shall also deny before my Father who is in the heavens. Do not think I've come to bring peace on earth. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword, for I've come to bring division. A man against his father, a daughter against her mother, and daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. A man's enemies are those of his own household. He who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he who loves sons or daughters more than me is not worthy of me. He who does not take up his stake and follow after me is not worthy of me. He who has found his life shall lose it. 
and he that has lost his life for my sake shall find it. He who receives you receives me, and he who receives me receives him who sent me. He who receives a prophet in the name of a prophet shall receive a prophet's reward, and he who receives a righteous one in the name of a righteous one shall receive a righteous one's reward. Whoever gives one of these little ones a cup of cold water only in the name of a taught one, truly I say to you, he shall by no means lose his reward. Man, my prayer for you guys is that indeed you would find your life in the Messiah, that you would be satisfied in him. For those of you that are still coming to this kingdom, still trying to wrap your head around all of these things, I just pray that the Father would anoint you with understanding, that he would give you the spirit of wisdom so that you can make wise choices and that you can come to understand that his word is life. He has such good things in here for you. And you know what? It also is costly. And I never want to be trans, I never want to hide that fact. It's a costly thing to enter into a covenant with the King of Kings. Understand it, it might be the death of you, but you will be born again into a kingdom of such miraculous deliverance, provision, such a bounty of hope and joy. Like there's a there's a guaranteed beautiful promise of joy that is hiding within that. And you know what? That's the true reality that is inescapable. That though the Messiah suffered much, you know what he got from it? joy abounding for generations like untold number of people have now had the opportunity to have the restoration of their relationship with the father given back to them like what joy he gave them from great sorrow like he sent them out to preach to the house of israel you understand this is like where the house of israel was really scattered you know if you go back into uh second kings here oh man some of the most devastating chapters in one sense in the scriptures This is in uh, chapter 17. It's brutal. But this is this is this is why the Messiah when he's sending those people out to the lost sheep of the house of Israel, this is where those lost sheep got scattered and this chapter is kind of a synopsis of really the whole history of the house of Israel when they got divided from the house of Judah. They used to be one whole big family of Israel. It wasn't just Jews. It wasn't just Benjamites. Like they were all united under King David really powerfully and then under King Solomon as well. But then it was under Rehoboam, his son, where it was split between 10 tribes and two. And you know what? That house of Israel went after, unfortunately, the sins of the first king, Jeroboam, Jeroboam, that really just destroyed the house and split it up terribly. So listen to this. This is why when he says something like sending him out to the lost sheep of house, house of Israel, this is the context of who those people are. And in the 12th year, this is chapter 17 of Second Kings. In the twelfth year of Ahaz, sovereign of Yehuda, Hoshea, son of Elah, began to reign over Israel in Shamaron for nine years. And he did evil in the eyes of Yahuwah, but not as the sovereigns of Israel who were before him. Shalom and Nessar, sovereign of Assyria, Asher, or Assyria, came up against him, and Hoshea became his servant and rendered him a present. But the sovereign of Asher found a conspiracy in Hoshea, for he had sent messengers to Sol, sovereign of Mitzrayim, and had not brought a present to the sovereign of Asher as year by year. And the sovereign of Asher shut him up and bound him in prison. And the sovereign of Asher went through all the land and went up to Shamaron and besieged it for three years. In the ninth year of Hosea, the sovereign of Asher captured Shamaron, Samaria, and exiled Yisrael to Asher and settled them in Halah and Habor and the river of Gozan in the city of the Medes, the cities of the Greeks. Now this came to be because the children of Israel had sinned against Yahuwah, their Elohim, who had brought them up out of the land of Mitzrayim from under the hand of Pharaoh, sovereign of Mitzrayim, and feared other mighty ones and walked in the laws of the nations whom Yahuwah had dispossessed from before the children of Israel of the sovereigns of Israel that he had made. And the children of Israel secretly did against Yahuwah, their Elohim, matters that were not right. And they built for themselves high places in all their cities, from watchtower unto the walled cities. And they set up for themselves pillars and asherim on every high hill and under every green tree, and burned incense there on all the high places like the nations whom Yahuwah had removed from their presence. And they did evil matters to provoke Yahuwah, and served the idols of which Yahuwah had said to them, Do not do this! 
And Yahuwah warned Yisrael and Yehuda through all of his prophets and every seer, saying, Turn back from your evil ways. Guard my commands and my laws, according to all the Torah which I commanded your fathers, and which I sent to you by my servants the prophets. But they did not listen and hardened their necks like the necks of their fathers who did not put their trust in Yahuwah their Elohim and rejected his laws and his covenant that he had made with their fathers and his witnesses, which he had witnessed against them and went after worthlessness and became worthless. And after them, after the nations who were all around them, of whom Yahuwah had commanded them not to do like them, and they left all the commands of Yahuwah their Elohim and made for themselves a molded image, two calves, and made an Asherah and bowed themselves to the host of heaven and served Baal and caused their sons and daughters to pass through the fire and practiced divination and sorcery and sold themselves to do evil in the eyes of Yahuwah and to provoke him. So Yahuwah was very enraged with Yisrael and removed them from his presence. None was left but the tribe of Yahuda alone. And Yahuwah also did not guard the commands of Yahuwah their Elohim, but walked in the laws of, of, Yisrael, of Yisrael which they made. And Yahuwah rejected all the seed of Yisrael and afflicted them and gave them into the hand of plunderers, until he had cast them out of his presence. For he tore Yisrael from the house of David, and they made Jeroboam son of Nebat sovereign. And Jeroboam drove Yisrael from following Yahuwah and made them commit a great sin. And the children of Yisrael walked in all the sins of Jeroboam, which he did. They did not turn away from them until Yahuwah removed Yisrael from his presence, as he spoke by all his servants, the prophets. So Yisrael was exiled from their land to Asher, as it is to this day. It's a brutal chapter, but it's an accurate summary of understanding. Like when we send our children into the nations to learn the ways of the nations, to bow down and submit themselves to falsehood, to lies, to vanity, to the sorceries of these other mighty ones, we reap that. Like it's an inevitability, but when we instead are able to guard the word, to preserve it, you know what? Yahuwah turns towards us to give us deliverance from our captors, to give us freedom from the constraints, from the oppression of the torturers, right? He called them the persecutors that came upon them or the plunderers. And you know what? So many people right now, we are experiencing the sufferings of being under the hand of those plunderers. But I am assured of this, that we have been given the authority by our Messiah to no longer fall prey to those plunderers, to no longer be victims of the great tyrannical reigns of these people, that we can be given the gift of life, the gift of this word to overcome all the wiles and the strategy of the enemy. Because you know what? The good news that those disciples went out bearing, the good news that was on their feet as they went out and carried this gospel was a gospel of deliverance, the good news of deliverance, that no longer did they have to fall victim to these perpetrators of these horrible atrocities, but they could be the overcomers of the enemy, that they overcame him by the blood of the lamb, the words of their testimony, and not loving their lives when faced with death. For those of you that are being faced with those difficult circumstances and those occasions, I just want you guys to take courage in his word, to remember that he will not leave you nor forsake you, that you can call on him in your hour of distress, that he will answer you, that he will lift up his face upon you, give you shalom, no chaos, that he will ransom you from all of the the snares that the enemy has put you in. You know what? He is faithful and capable of doing it. So confide in him, trust in him. He is an absolute rock and a shield and a good reward to those who seek him. I love you guys so much. Continue. I just want to say thank you again for your continued prayers and support for our family. You guys have been just showering us with so much, and I just thank you for that. All of you who have sent us incredible treasures and amazing things, thank you guys for all of your consideration for helping my wife and in all of these afflictions that she's been having. You guys have just been incredible towards our family, and I just want to thank you for that. I love you guys so much, and I do look forward to talking to you again soon. You guys have.